I think the human canine bond is one of the strongest things ever. dog will sit and start with you. And everybody says, well, because they're not smart, they're stupid. No, because they're loyal. Well, my grandfather was Walter Weatherwax, and uh, I didn't know him very well because he, he passed away when I was only three, but uh, he was from Missouri. He moved to New Mexico, where my father was born in 1907, and he was an Army Territorial Scout for, for the Indians, and he, he also was a U.S. Marshal, but not all the time. He also rode locally. He didn't travel with Buffalo Bill's Wild West Circus everywhere, because they went everywhere. Uh, but in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, where it was close, he also trained horses and was a trick rider for Buffalo Bill's Wild West Circus. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to introduce to you a Congress of the Rough 
fighters of the world. My father was born, he was always proud, he says, you know, I wasn't born in a state, he said, I was born in so I was born in, in a uh, territory, and he didn't have a birth certificate, they wrote it, he wasn't actually sure of what day he was born, because they wrote it in the Bible, well, it's when they got to it, you know, maybe three days later, four days, five days, who knows, and they'd put it in the, uh, in the Bible, and when he went to, uh, to do the John Wayne movie in Mexico in, in, in 1954, he had to get a passport. And that was really tough because he didn't have a birth certificate, but it, it worked out. My father would go down, I guess uh, there was this thing called a Nickelodeon, put a nickel in the Nickelodeon and you'd wind it and you could see things. Well, my father fell in love with the whole concept of, of Rin Tin Tan, a dog that plays in movies, you know, he, he really loved that. He says, this is what I want to do. So one day they went into town and he got this little dog called Wiggles. It was kind of loose there and they brought it home. But he and his brother, it's funny, they went to town and they, they taught this dog to pick up uh, uh, t uh, balls and stuff that would resemble an apple. So they'd go to town and the apple stand would be outside. One brother would release the dog, my father would be around the other corner, the dog would go up, steal the apple and run around the corner. Well, nobody's gonna pursue a dog for theft, so that's how they got their apples. How he got into the whole thing is he came to Hollywood and he was doing stand-in work, you know. They'd go down and be extras, not stand-in, but extras, as children. And they'd go down to the studio and they'd all wait. And then they'd come out and they'd pick some of them. He realized if he took a little dog with him, that that would be an extra thing, you know. That they'd say, oh, well, not only do we get a kid for the extra, we have a dog too, so that's extra bonus there. So he'd get picked over a lot of other kids. So he had a shot where the dog, he's supposed to be on a newspaper, uh, delivering papers on the bicycle and the dog is with him following him well what he did is he taught the dog to take the newspaper the dog ran in the house with the newspaper and because uh, they had the door open the people were outside he runs into the house the director says well you're you're finished but he says we need the dog for the interior shot well then my father went and did it where he drops the paper and goes back out the door for the interior shot and uh, there was a guy named Henry East there that saw this and he was an animal supplier he for, for dogs. He saw my father's talent. He says, you want to go to work for me? I worked for Henry East. He was a man that I was about 17 years old and I went to work for him. I was I was making five dollars a day working dogs and pictures. See, my dad, he used to train vaudeville acts. So we, we grew up in our family. And uh, five dollars a day I was making. So then uh, school started back. I was going back to school. I went back and I stayed the night trade and I said, well, this Henry's wanted me to come back and now he's offered me more money. So I quickly went back. And my father went to work for him and for him, he trained, uh, he trained Asta for the Thin Man. The dog's well trained. He'll behave himself. It might bite somebody. No, he's all right. Look, lie down. Lie down. Stand up. <laughs> and he did all the Thin Man movies. Then he quit him and went to work for another man named Rennie Renfro, who he trained Daisy to do all the Blondie Dagwood movies. And then my father decided, you know, I'm doing all this work and, and, and they're reaping the harvest from it. So he decided to train his own dogs and go in business for himself. And it was pretty tough. My father didn't keep college. Colleagues didn't get jobs. You know what we got our jobs with? Most of them were mutts. I'd go out and, uh, as a kid, I didn't have anybody to play with, so they'd find me out in the kennel with one of the mutts, flavor of the day. And uh, he did have a couple of shepherds because they got jobs. And we had a bulldog because they got jobs. But mostly it was mutts, nondescript dogs is what the movies wanted. So he didn't have a collie. And this guy named Howard Pat brought this collie to him. They were friends. He was a trainer himself. And he says, this dog chases motorcycles and his owner wants him broken. And he says, I can't break him with chasing these motorcycles. Could you? And I says, well, I think I can. So I charged him $70. And uh, well, I wasn't about to get away with that dog chasing out of it. He was still chasing him, unless you pin him up. Dad says, I can't break him up. And he says, just forget the whole thing. And he says, well, he says, but you do owe me board for about $10 for boarding him. And um, Fax said, we'll keep the dog. 
in lieu of the ten dollars. So actually, last year was the ten dollar purchase. Uh, this dog pal. Well, then my father didn't know what to do with him, and you know, times were tough. He had to feed all these dogs, and so he was going to take. My mother said, "Well, he was going to take him to the pound," but he decided, "No, I, I can't do that." So he found a guy named Duke York, and it, who had collies, and he farmed them out. He says, "You can keep them, and if I ever need them for movies, then I'll, I'll, I'll get them." You know, and he was fortunate enough that Lassie came along in 1944. Lassie is the story of a dog and a boy. The boy's family was poor, so poor they had to sell Lassie, and she was shipped hundreds of miles away. But Lassie never forgot the boy, her home, her people. Then one day she ran away. She was going home. Nothing could stop her, not miles, nor storms, nor danger, nor wounds. Twice she found refuge. Each time someone loved her, but a greater love urged her on. Uh, Metro Goldman brought the book, Lassie Come Home, from Eric Knight. for a collie. They had about 1,500 collars on it from kennels and everything, but they weren't trained. So I got this job. I had been in the business for years and years, and I happened to have a trained dog practice of every breed. So I got the job with a collie. He, now he has to go get this dog. Well, the dog has mange. He has no hair. He's all, he's a mess. And he gets the dog and goes in there because they told him, look, we need a dog to stand in for this other dog. It's not working properly. And they cast for a collie. They had about 1,500 collars on it from kennels in it, but they weren't trained. So they wanted a female. So they, they got somebody with a female collie, and I had the male. And uh, there's a man named Wilcox who was, was directing the picture. And last he had to swim around this thing and swim ashore and collapse and all this. Well, <laughs> Well, they're about to get this other dog to do it. And he said, the dogs are not performing properly. We need you to come in, Rudd, at least do this river shot. So Dad prepared for the river, basically. That's all he prepared for. And the dog swam in the river, and the current started carrying the dog down the river. So Dad just kept working, and it came out. <laughs> this is just crazy stuff. It came out right in front of that color camera that they were testing, and Dad just kept working. And we had him come out, lie down, crawl, get on your side, struggle. They shot it, you know. And, and when he got his I said, put your head down, you know, like I did here. Walk easy, now lie down on your side, dig it up. And Wilcox came running out of the deal, and he says, uh, Pal went in the river. See, my dog was named Pal. He says, Pal went in the river, but Lassie came out. So I had the main job. That's how I got it. That it was just meant to be, because who could script this, you know? Everybody Lassie's ever worked with, they become attached with a dog. Well, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, she she loves dogs. She's always had had them. Even on a boat, she had them, and uh, she was very much attached to Lassie. And Roddy McDowell, there is a sweetheart. Oh, guys, I used to let him take that dog home, and now you know I'm not going to let anybody take my dog home. But he'd say, "Rudd, please, man, take him." Well, I trusted the kid, see, and he'd take him on home, and and. Uh, bring him back the next day of the studio. But I didn't even do that very often. But, but then the dog, it was great because the dog got so used to him, you know, and likes to come home. And that's one way he did because he figured this is my owner too, my boss, you know.
Watch it, boys. Let the glasses grow. Come on. Hope you want to see what the gals do here. This is the scene where uh, Flashy runs onto the dock, Fred. She stops here and sees the kid in the boat. She looks back to the ranger that follows. As the boat's drifting off, this is in the water. Can Lassie handle that, right? Yes. Here, Lassie, pick it up. Pick it up. I'll hold it. Now that's all right. Oh, good. Okay, well then, when she gets it and it's out in the water, then we won't, would like her to swim right in here. And hopefully the boat will pull in on the land. Okay. And I'd like to bring in the kitten, please. Let Lassie see the kitten. There you are, Lassie. Little kid, you're going to stay. Oh, that's good, Sam. Put him on the front seat. Huh? Okay. Okay, Rudd, I think we're ready. We want to get your men in position. Okay. Hey, John, will you bring the boat in? Sam, I want you to take Lassie up on the bank, and when I call it, I'm going to be in the boat. When I call you, let go. And Robert, you stand over there, and when Lassie gets all the rope, you call it in there. Okay. All right, Rod, call Lassie. Lassie, come on, jump. Come on, come on, jump. You want to understand animals, you must get away from verbal language. An animal's world is pictures, smells, sounds, touch sensations, tactile sensations. It's a world of sensory detail. And when you understand that, you're going to really understand animals. If you want a good dog, you keep him as close to you as possible because you learn from him and he learns your moods and your voice inflections. And I take that and I transfer that on the set with the commands as I command them. Turn your legs. Back up. Back up. Turn your right. Over here. And then we actually transfer, like some actress once told me, she saw me change my moods about five times that day, and she says, uh, who's your psychiatrist, you know? Because if, if Lassie or whatever dog is to be excited, I become excited and he gets that through my voice. And if, if he's supposed to be subdued or whatever, I use that in my voice and I transfer my voice inflections to the dog to have him come in and, and reenact that type of situation. Head down, head down. Crawl, 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 come on, crawl. Head down, crawl, 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 come on, crawl. On your side. Now dig it up, dig it up, now speak, dig it up, dig it up, on your feet, easy, lame dog, lame dog, lame, 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 that's my baby, come on up and see your daddy, <laughs> that's your baby. I'm so closely netted with those animals, I'm always, I keep them near me as close as much as possible and that way they understand all this and then it's like you have to be a little schizophrenic for this, but that's that's how we get those emotions out of the dog. Hey, come on! Come on, over here! Come on, jump, 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 jump! I was, uh, I was the, the guy you teach the dog to kiss in the face. I had baby food on me all the time, and eventually you get away from the baby food. The dog learns to kiss you. But I always had that stuff in my face, and uh, he taught Lassie to go pick you up by the arm and bring you back. I have a picture of that somewhere at home. And then my sister, when he got ready for Courage of Lassie, the dog had a snarl in Elizabeth Taylor's face. So he liked to do it just the way it was. My sister is about the same age. So she was the one he practiced snarling the dog that far with his teeth bearing in her face.
starring Tommy Rettig as Jeff Miller. Jan Clayton as his mother, Ellen. George Cleveland as Gramps. And, of course, Lassie. Lassie, now listen. You stay with Timmy, girl. Take real good care of him. Like you always took care of me. And I'll come back to see you sometime, real soon. Goodbye, girl. Starring June Lockhart, John Provost as Timmy, and, of course, Lassie. I was his assistant for 333 episodes, nine years. And actually, my father, what he would do is sometimes after after lunch, he'd like to take a little nap. And I got to the point where I was so good. I was the third, I was the second assistant. He had a first assistant. But uh, my he would let me start to work the dog after lunch. I'd, I'd, I'd gotten to that point where he realized I knew what I was doing. You know, the thing is, is I wasn't supposed to do it. I was a fill-in. I was just going to do this a little bit. I was going to be a police officer. I was in the Army. I, I took MP school, so I'd have to step up. But I didn't weigh enough for my height. They were very strict in those days. So I'm trying to put on a weight, and I go there, and he uses me now and then. As a, and, and then pretty soon, they, I forgot about the police thing. I end up being a, uh, being a dog trainer. And he says, well, now that you have the position, at first, you know, you carry the bucket for the dog, you brush him, you carry, you know, you're not really, or you call him over the hill. And he says, well, it's about time you learned how to train one. So he had a litter, because he was replacing, getting ready to replace his last in two years, and he gave me one of the brothers. And then I went up, and while he was training that dog to be Lassie, I sat there and, and trained the other dog. But he let me start doing that. Actually, I did the very last Lassie show, because... Uh, hey, hey, who was playing last at that time? That was his other name, his off screen name. He had sprained his leg or something. He had a slight limp. So he let me take Silver, who I'd done Big Jake with. And uh, I actually did the very last Lassie episode ever made. But I think my father was trying to audition me to Frank in, too, because when the show closed down, I wouldn't have a job training. And, and, uh, but I was hired by somebody else. And I worked for another person for about four or five years. Then I went and hung my own shingle, too. You go ahead. You go right ahead. If there's anything I enjoy more than hanging a sheep earlier, it's hanging somebody who sticks his nose into my business. Go on. You try to cut that rope. No, you got me scared. You do it. Dog! Get him off! Get him off! Dog! Just who in the hell do you think you are? Jacob McCandles. Get in there. Now, now, boy. In here you go. Sit down. Let's put your seatbelt on. That's it. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Please note that Einstein's clock is in precise synchronization with my control watch. Got it. Right, check then. Good. Have a good trip, Einstein. Watch ahead. Red passed away five years ago, and now his son, Bob Weatherwax, has taken over the reins as Lassie's head trainer. This dog is a seventh generation descendant of the original collie, and the last animal Red Weatherwax ever trained. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Nudge it, nudge it, nudge it, get up there, nudge it. Get up there. Put your head down, put it down. Sometimes it's easier working with with the dog because animals um, relate to you instantly. You know, they feel your empathy and they know when you're going through pain. And so to be able to play all those scenes with Lassie was really, it was a great Steve, joy. Lie down, lie down. Put your head down, put it down. Stay. Take it out, take it out. Get off, get off. Well, Bob has done uh, an incredible job training him. I mean, I read some of the things in the script and I go, come on, this dog will never do that, you know, and the next day that dog is out there doing whatever it says. We do personal appearance with Lassie on the road and we'd perform at fairs and, and different venues. Bringing food, clothing, and gifts to the needy amongst the Navajo tribe in Monument Valley. Her caring during the annual Blessing of the Animals ceremony at Mission San Luis Rey. Adoration follows wherever she goes. Because her language is a universal language. The language of love. We would do fairs and uh, rodeos sometimes. I never liked rodeos, but we did fairs. And uh, what he would do is he'd have a, a writer put on his contract. It was an additional page that said that wherever we go, that we would go to a hospital, a children's hospital of some type. It didn't matter what type, uh, whether you know whatever the illness is. It didn't matter. So. We would do that, and uh, some of them was, was, was it's tough, you know, you have to smile when you go in there. And, uh, we went to the major burn clinic in Texas, and that was a toughie. We also showed the dog to a child that passed away before we left. When we came to the hospital, he says, take him up here first, this kid's, and the kid saw him, and he smiled, and before we left the hospital. But he did that, and I, you know, it was tough on him too. I can see this is, this is not good, this is hard to do. Why do you do that? He says, I came, I came from nothing. He says, I'm fortunate. He says, payback. 
It's my church, he said. That's how I do my church. I want to go to what we did with those personal appearances, those hospitals. I, I want to teach and with what, you know, autistic people, people I've taken Lassie to, people with Alzheimer's, they didn't know who it was, but they were happy. I would like to do that, and I'd like to show people how to train their dogs, to properly train them, so they can go and do these things. See the, see the, the veterans from the war that, that have come back, and these dogs are so good for any type of therapy, for anything. For some individuals with autism, a service dog really works well. There are three basic ways service dogs are used in uh, individuals with autism. You can use it as a therapy dog, where the dog is brought in by the therapist, and that's used as kind of an icebreaker to get the child to interact, or the dog serves as a companion for the child. And a third method is where the dog's tethered to the child to keep it from running off, and that has to be done very carefully to avoid stressing the dog. Now, is a service dog right for this particular child or adult with autism? One size doesn't fit all. For one individual, a service dog would be the best possible thing you could do. For another individual, it may not be a good choice. There are some individuals on the autism spectrum, they just instantly love the dog, and the dog and the child or the adult get along absolutely perfectly, they bond. Another type of individual might be afraid of the dog at first, but then after he works with them some, he really gets to like the dog. And the third type, the dog would not be appropriate. This is the individual where there's a lot of sensory problems, they may not like the smell of the dog, maybe the sound of a dog barking hurts their ears, uh, then the, probably the dog would not be a good choice. I'm not going to train a lot of dogs myself, I've trained so many dogs, but I can show other people how to train their dogs. So he's properly trained, they have that venue, they have that avenue and that pathway so they can go and, and, and work with people's hearts and minds.